Imam al Ghazali is called Hujjat al Islam, the proof of Islam, which is a title that the Sunni tradition does not really use. The Shia tradition uses it and still uses it to this day. In the Sunni tradition, he is Hujjat al Islam. He is the only one that has that title in our tradition. There are other people that have the title of Shaykh al Islam. There are many, many honorific titles that people get Al Qadi, Al Imam. But Imam al Ghazali is unique amongst the Sunni tradition in that he has that title, the proof of Islam. My own teacher, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, said to me recently that the struggle within Islam is a struggle between two visions of Islam the vision of Imam al Ghazali and the vision of Ibn Taymiyyah. And he said that what is interesting is that Ibn Taymiyyah, who came after Imam al Ghazali, and this is from a man who knows both of these scholars intimately. He said that Ibn Taymiyyah is constantly referring to Imam al-Ghazali. And there are many things that Imam al-Ghazali said that troubled Imam Ibn Taymiyyah. And so he in essence is refuting or responding to them. And what Shaykh Abdullah bin Bayyah said is that Imam al-Ghazali won the first round. And it lasted for many centuries. Imam al-Ghazali was considered the great reference for Islamic tradition. His books have been taught throughout the Muslim world. To this day, his book at Mustasfa is used as one of the primary textbooks in what we would consider in our culture constitutional law. The, the basis of how legislation is derived from legal principles. And al Mustasfa is one of the most important books in that tradition. He introduced into Usul al Fiqh, which is the methodology of the Mushtahidun or the scholars who derive these laws, he introduced concepts that had not existed before him. He was also an extraordinary theologian and wrote several texts on theology. But what he is most known for amongst the Muslims is that he is the scholar that was uniquely capable in the Islamic tradition to build a bridge between the esoteric and the exoteric truths of religion. And this is something that religions have such a difficult time grappling with. The esoteric tradition, the inward meanings of a religion, and then the outward aspects of that religion. If we look at the tradition that I was raised in, which is uh, within the Christian tradition, the Orthodox tradition, Christians have grappled with the God of the Old Testament for centuries and trying to understand the relationship between that God who seems so different from the God of the New Testament. And they came up with many different creative responses to that problem. Marcion, who was later considered a heretic or within his own lifetime, Marcion was so troubled by it that he had to create a separate God. Yahweh was not the God of the New Testament because he could not square the God of love and mercy and compassion and forgiveness with the God who told people to go into villages and destroy every living thing. He could not understand how those two could come together. Later, the medieval scholastics often used allegorical interpretations to understand these things. But these are really allegories, and this was a dominant form of Christianity. Calvin had a great uh, restoration of a more literal understanding of that God. But for centuries, Christians understood these things to be allegorical. And within the Catholic tradition, you, you still have that. But Imam al-Ghazali said, no, both aspects of religion are needed. They are the two wings with which religion flies. Without one, it can't fly. It must have both. This is something that we're finding now around the world. And religion has always suffered from these problems. This is not a new problem. It's always suffered from these problems. But the normative practice of religion, and, and when I use that word, what I mean is, is the standard, the standard that people understood 
how they understood the Prophet Muhammad Muslims never understood the Prophet Muhammad to be primarily a political leader, although he was a political leader. They never understood him to be pri primarily a military genius, although he was a military genius. They never understood him to be a merchant as a primary, although he was a merchant. They always understood him to be a mercy. That is the essence of the Islamic teaching of who the Prophet Muhammad is. A mercy. This is how he's described in the Quran. Every chapter in the Quran, with the exception of one, begins in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Rahma, which is how the Prophet is described as a mercy to all the worlds, was the essence of this teaching. And this is why modern Muslims have to marvel at how distorted the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad have become in the minds of many Muslims. They have to marvel. But they should also understand that our Prophet said, Islam began as a strange thing, and the same word that he used, gharib, badat islamu gharibun. Gharib can also mean an alien. It began as a strange thing, and it will return as a strange thing. And then he said, Blessed are the strangers. And they said, who are the strangers, O Messenger of God? And he said, those who rectify my teaching after it has been corrupted by people. This hadith is a clear proof that his teaching can be distorted, can be misrepresented. And this is the corrective that Imam al-Ghazali played in the 11th century. He called the outward scholars mutarassimun, the formalists, the people that were trapped in the outward meanings of things and couldn't penetrate to the essence of things. He had a great difficulty with sectarianism. And the reason was because he felt that every sect always limited the pursuit of their questions. They never took their questions to the full conclusions. And that's how they ended up in their sectarianism. And that's why he said they could quote the same verses and the same hadith that were understood by other people, and they would use them for their own ends because their own assumptions were foregone conclusions in their minds, and then the texts simply become ammunition by which they justify their distortions. But he was also somebody who was acutely aware of the psychological nature, and this is what to solve the psychological aspect that Raghub Isfahani focuses on. He was aware of the psychological nature, what Francis Bacon called the idols of the cave and the tribe. The idols that are in the, created by the mind as a result of human nature, but also those the tribe, and then the idols of the cave that are idiosyncratic to individuals. He understood that, that aspect of human beings. And so he said that when I look at Christians, their children become Christians. When I look at Jews, their children become Jews. And when I look at Muslims, their children become Muslims. That most people, in fact, are simply results of what, in modern parlance, to use Heidegger's term, are results of their own historical environment, what he called thrownness, that they're thrown into historical environments and they absorb those environments and then they never challenge those environments. But he was somebody that was constantly challenging the environment in which he grew up in. And because he was such an authentic individual, and what's important to understand about him in his search is that he was such a phenomenal genius, he could not lose an argument, which is probably one of the worst things that God can do for a person, is give them the ability to win every argument. Because it creates a type of arrogance and pride that is really unbelievable. And all of us have met those types of people in our life's journey. Some of us have been those types of people. <laughs> and some of us are still exercising those qualities from ourselves. But Imam al-Ghazali could win any argument. And he got to a point of his rational understanding 
that he had an existential crisis. He literally fell apart. He once went to a lecture and he wanted to start talking and he couldn't talk. And he said God took his voice away from him. The very thing that had elevated him was now abasing him. His ability to speak. And, and we underestimate the power of oratory, the power of rhetoric, the power of, of rational as well as emotional reasoning. We underestimate that power, but it is an immense power. We have a president of the United States right now that proved that power. The power to inspire people, the power to speak to people's hearts. Imam al-Ghazali had that taken away from him. He went into a crisis and literally abandoned everything. And it was something that he actually says in his confessions where he says, I would put one foot forward, it's an, it's an Arabic idiom, but he said, I would put one foot forward one day and then pull it back the next day. And until God decided the matter for me. Almost 40 years old, what we would call probably today a midlife crisis. And he set out, and for 12 years he roams the Muslim world, completely incognito. He spent a period of time where he actually was the the, the man who swept the Umayyad mosque in Damascus. I mean, if you can imagine, this is the greatest theologian of his time, honored by kings, had the chair at the Nivania College, which would be like the Harvard uh, of the Muslim world at that time, and he becomes a man who's sweeping the Umayyad masjid, the Umayyad mosque. Incredible humility. When he goes back to Tus at the end of his life, where he began, one of the people who knew him earlier said that he did not believe that the transformation was real. He thought he must, because he'd heard he'd become humble. And he went and he sat with him, and he, the man was so overwhelmed by the spiritual presence of Imam al-Ghazali. And I'll give you one clue to that presence. Ibn, Ibn al-Arabi, the Qadi, there's a famous philosopher, but the Qadi came from Andalusia, from Spain. When he went to meet Imam al-Ghazali in Iraq, he said, and this is a man who was a master of the Islamic sciences of his time, incredible erudition. He said, when I entered into the room, the sun rose before my eyes, and all darkness was dispelled for me, and the truth became manifest to me. Now, that is, is for some people hyperbole, but for people who have ever been in the presence of a sanctified being, I think they would get that to some degree. It's very hard for people to understand that in the West, one of the things that we are sorely lacking is saints. But this is the reality of the sanctified soul. They have an overwhelming presence that can transform you in a moment. And, I, and I'm speaking from personal experience of sitting with my own teacher in the Saharan Desert, Marabd al-Hajj, whose presence, when I read that description of Imam al-Ghazali, I got a glimpse of it in my own teacher. And I was once sitting in my teacher's presence, and I had such an overwhelming experience of unity and happiness and joy. And I had my eyes closed, and I, and I wondered, because there was another young Westerner with me in the room, and I wondered if he, he was experiencing something of what I was experiencing, and I opened my eyes and I looked at him. And he looked at me, and he just made this, he just went, And that said everything for me about what was happening because we were in the presence of somebody who had emptied his self. And this is what Imam al-Ghazali had done. He was so full of himself. And we, we use that expression in the most derogatory meaning in our culture. He's full of himself. The Egyptians, when they want to say, watch out, they say, khalli balik min nafsik. I've never met an Egyptian that knows what that means. They, they know it means watch out, but they don't know what it really means because what it means is empty your mind of yourself if you really want to watch out. Empty your mind of yourself. And this is at the essence of the Christian teaching as well. The emptying out of the self. It's what the people of Tasawwuf call takhliya, 
the emptying, emptying of the self that precedes tahliya, the ornamentation of the imitatio dei, the imitation of God, where we take on the qualities that God loves and has described God himself with the quality of mercy. The Prophet Muhammad said, Take on these qualities that God has described himself with. Generosity, mercy, forbearance, patience, gratitude. These are the things that the emptying of the self enables to happen. And without it, it can't happen. And when you have people that are on a spiritual path that are committed to this, a different type of religion emerges.